Hello Homegrown! This time I will be covering both seed saving and season extension, our two fall topics. So first up is seed saving. It might seem a little bit silly to talk about saving seeds when you can easily get them from the store, but there are actually a lot of different reasons why you might want to save seeds. Um, first of all, it increases your independence. Um, in some years, like this year, um, seeds might sell out or a variety that you like to grow may no longer be available. Um, so if you have your own steady supply of seeds, you don't have to rely on anyone else to provide them for you. It also saves money. Um, individual seed packets aren't terribly expensive, usually between 50 cents and $3 depending on the seeds, but Depending on how many different packets you need, um, that can definitely add up. Saving seeds does require extra time and sometimes garden space that could have been used for growing more food, but if you focus on saving the seeds that take the least effort or the ones that you'd buy the most of, uh, you can definitely save quite a bit of money. You can also adjust a crop to your specific garden. The more years you save seeds of a particular variety, the more adapted it will become to your garden and the better it will produce. These effects are stronger in some plants than others. Self-pollinating crops and very old heirloom crops probably won't change much, but good cross-pollinators and newer varieties will evolve over time and become stronger and stronger. You can also try your own breeding experiments, like if you want to select for extra large peppers, or if you notice that certain tomatoes seem more resistant to disease, you can save those seeds in the hopes that those traits might be carried on. You can go for just about anything. The biggest plant, the biggest fruit, the best flavor, blight or bug resistance, early harvest, cold or heat tolerance, the list goes on. You can even intentionally mix different varieties together and breed your own brand new variety. You can also preserve historical heirloom varieties. This is essential because every year more and more heirloom crops are being lost as growers switch to more modern varieties. Corporate hybrid seeds are very fragile because the way they're produced, if we lose that corporation, we lose that crop. So it's very important that we keep heirlooms growing to preserve their diversity and we don't lose all of their flavors and characteristics that have been bred out of many modern vegetables. Finally, saving seeds is fun and interesting and it can be very easy, so there's really no reason why not to. Alright, so I want to do a quick review of the birds and the bees um, because you need to understand how seeds actually work if you want to save them successfully. So first of all, pollination. All vegetable crops do produce flowers, um, even though we harvest some crops before we ever see them. And of course, uh, once the flowers are pollinated, they will produce seeds, usually in either a fruit or a pod or a seed head. There are multiple ways to pollinate a flower. Of course, insects are the most commonly known, where a bee flies from one flower, collects pollen, and then flies to the next flower and drops it off. This can happen from one plant to another plant, or it can happen between two flowers on the same plant, and in many cases, either way will work. Then there's wind pollination. In corn, for example, the main method of pollination is for wind to carry pollen off of the tassels where it will land on the silks of an ear. Finally, there is self-pollination where the crop always or almost always pollinates itself all within one flower. Knowing which method is used for each plant is important because it will let you know what you need to do to make sure the seeds will form the way you want them to and um, that information is on both of the charts that I have for you. So, of course, the way reproduction works, the two individuals have to be the same species. A dog can't breed with a cat. But two individuals of a species can look very different from each other and still reproduce. You can breed a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. So you need to know your vegetable species, um, which you find out by looking at their scientific name. Peppers are capsicum annuum. Jalapenos and bell peppers are both capsicum annuum. So just like dog breeds, um, there are different varieties of the same species, so they can be bred together. You may also sometimes see the word cultivar, which means the same thing as variety or breed. 
When two different varieties are bred together, this is called cross-pollination, and it will result in a new plant that has traits of both parents. Generally, this is pretty simple. All tomatoes are one species, so a Mr. Stripey and a Mortgage Lifter can cross with each other, but tomatoes and cucumbers are different, so they won't. Okay. The reason why you need to check the scientific name is that sometimes it can be surprising. For example, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, and collards are all the same species, Brassica oleracea. So if you want to save seeds from those, it's important to know that you could end up with crosses in between them if they were flowering at the same time. So if you have a jalapeno mom and a bell pepper dad, the seeds are the babies, and those seeds will be a cross in between them. But you won't know that until you plant those seeds. The one exception to this is corn, uh, where you will see cross-pollination right away. For everything else, if your squash and your pumpkins cross-pollinate, you won't see anything weird unless you save the seeds and plant them next year. I will say as a side note that it is sometimes possible for closely related species to cross with each other the way a horse and a donkey can make a mule. This is pretty rare, but it does happen, and it will result in either unviable seeds, seeds that won't germinate, um, or a plant that doesn't produce seeds of its own. Cucurbita pepo is the species for summer squash and zucchini, as well as some pumpkins, spaghetti squash, acorn squash, and some gourds. So those will all cross with one another. Butternut squash, buttercup, Hubbard, Kusha, and a few others are all different species, but this is one of those circumstances where they can occasionally cross between species and make a mule, if you will, just as a note. So here's a few more notes on uh, varieties and species. Um, Cucumis mellow is most melons, like cantaloupe and honeydew, so those will cross with each other. Uh, cucumbers and watermelons are each their own species, Cucumis sativus and Citrullus lanatus, and generally they won't cross with any other cucurbits. Lima beans, fava beans, and scarlet runner beans are all different species from regular green bean varieties. It's not likely that those will cross-pollinate. Tomatoes and tomatillos do not cross-pollinate. Hot peppers and sweet peppers do, but remember you won't taste anything until next year. Beets and chard are the same species, in case you happen to be saving seed from both of those. Um, and you, if you have a meadow near your garden, you will need to think about what might be growing out there. Because carrots are the same species as Queen Anne's lace. So if you have Queen Anne's lace nearby, you might not want to save carrot seeds. Turnips may cross with wild mustard, and radishes may cross-pollinate with wild radishes if there are any. Once a crop has crossed, you can't uncross it, and each generation afterward may be pretty variable, pretty different from year to year. So if that's not something that you're interested in, you will have to start over again with new seeds. But if it is, um, there's no limit to the exploring and experimenting that you can do with testing out new varieties. The possibility of accidental cross-pollination should definitely not stop you from saving seeds. It's just something to remember in case your crop turns out a little unusual the following year. And there are multiple ways to prevent this. So if you don't want your zucchini to cross with your yellow squash or your cherries with your brandywine tomatoes, um, you have to stop the pollen from moving from one flower to the other. Of course, you could only let one variety of any species flower at any given time. Uh, you could do this by just not planting other varieties of the same species, but your garden might end up pretty boring. Um, or you could stagger each planting so that each variety will flower at different times, but this won't work for crops that flower for extended periods of time, like tomatoes. You can also physically separate the flowers. If you have multiple plants that you want to save from, you can cover the entire section of that variety with row cover fabric, um, pulled tight just to make sure that no bugs can get in or out. Or if you only need to save a few seeds, you could just cover individual flowers. You will need to hand pollinate any covered flowers. 
Plants that need cross-pollination will have to be pollinated by moving a paintbrush or something similar in between flowers. Self-pollinators can just be given a little shake every day to make sure that the pollen moves around. And finally, um, you can plant different varieties far apart. The pollination range is very different for different crops, so this is where the uh, seed savers exchange chart comes in handy. Corn um, can be wind pollinated occasionally from over a mile away, while self-pollinating uh, green beans can just be sometimes a few feet apart. Um, remember that they also have to be away from any natural areas if wild cross-pollination is possible, um, and any neighbors with gardens or farms growing similar crops. If that's not possible, you're going to need other methods like covering the flowers. The pollination distances are given as a range because there are multiple factors involved. The fewer obstacles there are in between varieties, the more distance is needed to prevent cross-pollination. Like if you have one plant on one side of your yard and one on the other side, but there's just grass in between them, the insects will probably go from one to the other. But if they had to go around your house and some trees and a bunch of flowers, they'll probably get distracted and are less likely to make it. So choose within that range based on how easy it is to get from one to the other. The isolation distance can also be adjusted just um, based on how much you care. Uh, if you're trying to preserve a specific heirloom variety, you'll want to take it more seriously than if you are just trying to save money on tomato seeds. The furthest distance in the range um, should be far enough to be sure that varieties will be preserved. You also don't have to save every seed every year. Let's say you have five varieties of tomatoes that you like. If you choose one variety every year to grow in isolation away from the other four with covers or bags or distance, um, then you can save five years worth of seeds. Then you rotate which one you grow in isolation each year, so you don't have to worry about isolating and saving five different types of tomato seeds every year. When you first get started saving seeds, it's very important that you choose the right varieties to save seeds from. You need to check the seed packet and find out whether the variety is open pollinated or an F1 hybrid. Uh, the packet may not say directly, but if it's an heirloom variety that is open pollinated and sometimes a hybrid will be called an improved variety. This is very important because you can't save seeds from hybrid varieties only open pollinated varieties. Open pollinated vegetables are grown in the natural way with insects carrying pollen around and the variety evolving over time. Open pollinated seeds are stable and predictable. They'll produce just about the same results year after year as long as they're kept in the same variety and not cross pollinated. When the offspring are just like their parents year after year, that's called true to type. Hybrids, on the other hand, have very specifically controlled pollination, oftentimes in a lab, so they can be bred for specific traits. Hybrid seeds are generally the ones that are labeled with disease resistance, pest resistance, drought resistance. Um, F1 means that the seeds are the first generation coming from their very specific parents. The problem with hybrids is that the F2 generation, the one that you would get by breeding the F1s, will look nothing like the F1 generation or the parents. It would be a random mix of traits. So instead, you have to go back to the parents and make another F1 generation the following year, in year after year. So if you were to try to save seeds from an early girl tomato, which is a hybrid, and you plant it out 100 plants, you might get a couple of good ones, um, but you'll probably get a whole lot that are small or weak or taste bad or definitely not early girls. That's why I said that if we lose the corporations that make the hybrids, we lose the seeds because we can't make them on our own. So it's a trade-off. You may want to buy F1 hybrids in order to get those special benefits like disease resistance. If you have issues with something like late blight, it might be really important to buy late blight resistant seeds, but just know that you will need to buy them every year. 
Um, one other note about choosing hybrid or open pollinated seeds, um, since hybrid seeds are so uniform, all of your plants from that packet will ripen pretty much all at the same time. Sometimes this is what you want, um, like if you're doing a lot of canning, you want them ready all together. Other times, you might want the more gradual ripening of open pollinated varieties. This keeps you from having to deal with the entire harvest all at once, and in case of an ill-timed storm or flood or something, um, you shouldn't lose your whole crop. Some crops, like cabbage and carrots, are called biennial, which means instead of annuals, which grow and die over one season, or perennials, which live for many years, biennials live for two years. So if you wanted to grow carrots for seeds, you would have to wait until its second year in your garden to see its flower. Most brassicas are biennials, um, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, collards, and turnips, as well as many root crops, beets, carrots, parsley, chard, leeks, onions, and rutabagas. Biennials need to experience winter to cause them to flower and set seed. This is called vernalization. In most cases, you should be fine to just um, trim the plant down and then put a thick layer of mulch on top over the winter and they'll start growing again in the spring. If you want to dig them up, you can, um, either to check the roots for quality, maybe you want to move them to another location because in their second year they will all grow very large. Um, if you do this, just wait until after the first couple of freezes um, to make sure that they are in their, their winter mode. You can also dig them up and move them inside. Um, like if it's a really important plant and you just don't want to risk it dying during the winter, um, after the first couple of freezes, cut off the leaves and dig up the plant so you just have the main stalk and the roots and store it in cold, damp conditions um, in the upper 30s is best. And then as soon as you're able to get out in the garden in spring, plant them back outside and wait for the seeds to grow. But um, this isn't really necessary unless um, the plant is really important to you. When you harvest seeds, um, you have to be sure to harvest them at the right time because in many cases, they're not ready until after you would harvest the crop for eating. And it's a very rare case that you can get viable seeds from a fruit or a pod that was picked too early. But if you wait too long, you could end up with pest damage, uh, rot, or shattering. Um, shattering is when the seed pod breaks open and scatters the seeds all over the ground. So you will need to watch your plant closely so that you can harvest at just the right time. You should start looking well before it's time to harvest so that you can choose which plants and which fruits you want to save seeds from. You may want to mark them um, so that they don't accidentally get harvested. You should always be looking for the healthiest plants, not only because this will help breed stronger plants in the future, but also to prevent any diseases from being passed into your garden next year through infected seeds. Never save seeds from diseased plants, especially with viruses. You should also be looking out for plants that have the traits that are most important to you, best flavor, highest yield, and so on. Um, if your best pepper is on a weak plant, it might give you a weak plant next year, so choose your best plants overall. And do not save seeds from damaged fruits. Um, saving seeds is not a good use for any of the ones you wouldn't want to eat otherwise, anything that's split or moldy or with bug holes. Um, damage can be a sign of a weak plant and it's also an open wound for diseases to potentially enter. Also, it is always, always best to save seed from more than one plant, if you can. You'll probably get more than enough from a single plant for most small gardens, but you'll be much better off if you save seeds from multiple plants and then mix them together and then you could share the rest or save them for future years. Next year's crop will be more resilient and you will correct for a lot of potential problems. Here is a quick run through of when different crops are ready for seed harvest. Tomatoes are easy because the seeds are ready for harvest at the same time as the tomato. Just wait until it's fully colored and on the road to overripe. 
Peppers are ready for seed harvest uh, just after you would harvest them to eat. So they should have full color and then be starting to shrivel. Winter squash and melons are also ready when the fruit is ready. Cucumbers and summer squash have to be left longer. The summer squash should end up feeling more like a winter squash where it's really tough and the stem is going dry. This is a perfect use for zucchini that got away from you and grew giant. Um, just let them stay on the vine all the way until the end of the season. Cucumbers should turn yellow and it's also best to keep them on the plant all the way until it dies or at least a few weeks after it turns yellow if you can. Summer squash, winter squash, and cucumbers should all be left to sit for around three weeks after removing them from the plant to make sure that the seeds are fully mature before harvesting the seeds, if possible. With okra, um, you just let the pods grow giant um, until they're dry and brittle. This will take all summer, so start early. Beans and peas also mature and dry on the vine over the course of the summer. Ideally, the pods will be brittle by the end of the year, but if they're only at the point of soft and shriveled and yellow, that may be enough. If cold weather is approaching, you can pull up the entire plant with the roots and let the pods dry out for a few more weeks. Herbs like cilantro and dill are easy, especially if you're harvesting the seeds anyway as spices. Just wait for them to dry as much as possible. Um, you're probably familiar by now with lettuce bolting, that's the flower stalk, so it's a perfect opportunity to save seeds if your lettuce gets away from you. Um, lettuce seeds have a bit of fluff on them like dandelions, so you may want to put a bag over them if you're worried that they might blow away. Most root crops will send up a similar flower stalk like bolting, and sometimes you'll get a seed head in that case. Brassicas form uh, skinny little pods that will dry and shatter, um, but you will need to harvest multiple times because they aren't all ready at the same time in most cases. Corn is ready when the kernels are hard and dry. A word on corn, um, it is one of the more difficult seeds to save for a few reasons. Um, Corn is strongly outbreeding, which means that it needs a lot of other corn plants around to cross-pollinate with in order to get viable seeds. So if you want to save corn successfully, it's best to plant a block of at least 10 plants. If you want to save seeds long term or work on an heirloom, it's better to have more like 50 or more plants. The other difficulty with corn is that it is wind pollinated so it's harder to control cross-pollination. This shouldn't be an issue if there are not other varieties of corn nearby, but occasionally corn pollen can travel up to a mile. A few hundred feet is usually enough to prevent most corn cross-pollination, but if it's important to you to have the corn seeds that are completely true to type, um, you will have to put in some extra effort to prevent that. The situation is the same for spinach, chard, and beets, which are also wind-pollinated crops. It's best to have a number of those plants flowering together, and it's also harder to control unwanted cross-pollination, but if you don't have other varieties nearby, it won't be an issue. So how do you actually save the seeds? Each crop is a little bit different, um, so I'm just going to go over some highlights, but you can check out the Southern Exposure chart for more detailed instructions, and check the Seed Savers Exchange crop guides. There are two main methods for saving seeds, dry and wet. Some crops like peppers and eggplant don't fall too neatly into either of these categories, but they generally all use the same techniques. Dry is the one that's more familiar. You wait for the seed pods to get brittle, and the seeds inside are already mostly dry and ready to go. This is how you save beans, peas, lettuce, and brassicas. Try to time these harvests for the fall when the weather is dry. If it's not possible for the seed pods to dry out before the first frost, harvest the entire pod or seed head or the entire plant and leave them to dry for a few weeks longer before harvesting the seeds to try and let them mature a little bit more. 
Make sure that you are watching um, dry process seeds carefully um, so that you can collect them before they shatter onto the ground. And um, like I mentioned with lettuce, you can uh, put a cover over them if you're worried about that happening. Once you have the seeds, it's best to lay them out on paper plates or on screens where they can get some good um, airflow for anywhere from two to six weeks or so um, to make sure that they're entirely dry before storage. Larger seeds like beans or peas could use the occasional stir during this process and um, keep seeds out of the sun while they're drying. Then there is the wet method, which is really sort of two methods. Some seeds like pumpkin seeds just have a little bit of goop on them and these can be just washed very thoroughly and um, set out to dry for a few weeks. Other seeds that are inside fruits like tomatoes and cucumbers have that thick gel layer over them which prevents them from germinating too early um, inside of that wet environment. To save those seeds, it's best to go through a fermentation process to remove that gel layer before storing. These seeds can also just be rinsed off and stored, but they will have better quality if they're fermented first. You can use this method for tomatoes, cucumbers, and melons, and also squash if you would like to. Fermentation helps you sort out the bad seeds, um, potentially helps reduce some seed-borne diseases, and improves germination rates for those crops. So to ferment the seeds, um, you cut open the fruit, scoop some seeds out into a clean glass jar, and um, squeeze some juice in there too to make it a liquid environment. If you don't have enough juice, you can also add a little bit of non-chlorinated water. Set the jar aside for about one to four days. You can cover it with a cloth or a coffee filter, but nothing airtight. A layer of mold will probably form on the surface. Um, this is normal, so just make sure that you put the jar in a place where this will be okay. Stirring the seeds once or twice a day might help prevent mold. The fermentation is finished when the gel coating has separated from the seeds and floated up while the seeds have sunken down. If you see any bumps coming out of the seeds, it's been too long and they're starting to sprout. So when it's done fermenting, add water to the jar and stir it around. The good seeds should all be at the bottom of the jar while the pulp is floating on top. There may be some floating seeds. These are generally not viable and should be poured off with the pulp. Then you just rinse the seeds with plenty of water and spread them out on a screen or paper plate to dry. Um, this could take four weeks or more. Again, fermentation is not 100% necessary. You can just rinse them and dry them if you don't have the time, but you should expect lower viability and a shorter shelf life. And then there are a few crops that are not usually grown from seeds, particularly potatoes, sweet potatoes, and garlic. This is because these crops are very easy to grow from pieces and very difficult to grow from seeds. And even if you are able to grow them from seeds, they will not grow true to type. So instead, um, we use asexual propagation, um, basically cloning. Uh, so just like any other crop, uh, potatoes do produce seeds, but it's rare that you'd see them because many modern varieties are now sterile. Um, when they are produced, the seeds come in fruits that look kind of like uh, green cherry tomatoes, but uh, these are toxic. If you saved the potato seeds and grew them, you would not get potatoes like the plant they came from. It would be a random mix of traits like those F2 hybrid seeds. So instead, we save the whole potatoes. Um, they're called seed potatoes, even though there are no seeds involved. And you grow a new potato plant that is genetically the same plant from last year. It's extremely easy to save seed potatoes. However, I hesitate to recommend it because it is very common for diseases to pass through them into next year's crop. You may not have issues, especially in the first few years, but if and when a disease does appear, it may be very hard to get rid of. This is frustrating because seed potatoes can be expensive to buy and they're so easy to save, but if you really want to protect your garden, you'll need to buy 
USDA certified disease-free seed potatoes. If you do decide that you want to take the risk and save your own seed potatoes, um, you'll need to read up on all the signs of blights, how to prevent them, how to recognize them, so that you can avoid saving infected potatoes. You may want to buy um, seed potatoes once every few years and save in the years in between. Um, yields from saved potatoes do tend to go down over time and bringing in certified potatoes might be able to help break up any potential disease buildup. Also, some people buy grocery store potatoes instead of seed catalog potatoes, um, and this can be a cheaper option, but they do have a risk of disease. So if you choose that route, um, organic potatoes will sprout better than conventional. Sweet potatoes. Um, these are somewhat less prone to disease than potatoes. It is still possible, so it's up to you whether you want to buy certified or save your own. If you're going to save one or the other, I definitely would recommend sweet potatoes because it is less of a risk. And obviously, never save any sweet potatoes if they do have signs of disease. So I gave you all slips this year, which were those little bare root sweet potato plants. New plants can be grown by burying the sweet potato itself, but if you plant them from slips, you can get about 10 times as many and you'll have more time for them to ripen up before the end of the year. You may not need more than 10 slips, but I do recommend that you set aside multiple sweet potatoes for starting, just in case there are any issues along the way. So pick out the potatoes um, from the best plants when you harvest and set them aside so you won't lose them. There's no need to save your biggest sweet potatoes for seed. The medium ones will actually put out more slips than large or small potatoes. Store them over the winter, just like the rest of your sweet potatoes, and then around mid-March or so, it's time to sprout them. One common method is to stick toothpicks in them, so they are halfway in a glass of water, and this is really easy to do in the kitchen. The only tricky part about this method is that you need to know which way is up. Sweet potatoes have a root end and a shoot end, and they can't be switched. The root end has to go in the water, and the shoot end has to go up. Usually you can tell them apart because the root end is tapered, it's pointier, um, maybe a little bit shriveled, and the shoot end is rounder, has more eyes, and has a scar from where it was attached to the plant. So try to make a mental note or an actual note as you're harvesting of which way is which if it's not going to be clear. If you really can't tell, um, you can also try laying the potato down on some moist potting soil and sprouting it that way instead of in a glass of water. Um, this is also why it doesn't really work to cut up sweet potatoes like regular potatoes for starting. You do need the whole thing. So once you have the root end in the water and it's held securely with toothpicks, um, you'll need to let it sit for a few weeks in a warm place out of direct sunlight. It's a good idea to change the water and rinse out the jar every week or so to keep everything fresh. After a few weeks, um, sprouts should have grown out of the top of the potatoes. Once those sprouts are at least six inches tall, you can remove them from the mother potato. You just um, you can break them off at the base, or if you are worried about disease, um, you can cut them off about an inch away from the potato, and it's a little less likely to have any disease transmission. Put the slips in a glass of water, and just the same, just keep the water level up, change the water every so often, and you should see roots begin to grow after maybe a week or so. The slips can stay in the water for a pretty long time. The roots um, can grow pretty long and that's fine, but if the slips are ready too early and they're clearly starting to suffer, you can move them to potting soil to hold them over until you can get them out into your garden. Just cover them loosely. And um, remember to harden off the slips with that process of moving them inside and outside, just like with transplants, before you put them out in the garden. Garlic is another one that isn't grown from seeds. Hard neck garlic is able to produce seeds, but it's a very painstaking process. If you really wanted to save a lot of garlic and multiply your crop, you could save the little bulbils that grow out of the scapes, but 
by far the easiest and most effective way is to just plant the cloves. It's very easy to grow garlic out of the cloves. You just store them after harvest and when you're ready to plant, you break the cloves off the bulbs and stick them in the ground. The pointy end goes up and the part that was attached to the bulb goes down. Plant the garlic after the first frost in the fall. November is usually the best time. Plant them about two inches deep and cover them with several inches of mulch. They might sprout within a few weeks and that is fine. Um, and once again, be sure to save cloves only from healthy plants and um, set them aside, especially when you harvest, you know which ones you want to replant. Okay, seed storage. Um, to test if seeds are dry enough for storage, um, try breaking them in half or smashing them with a hammer. Um, they should shatter or break. If they dent or bend or crush, they're not dry enough and they need more time. And then you store saved seeds just like the rest of your vegetable seeds in airtight containers in a cool, dry place out of direct sunlight. Paper envelopes are a good choice if you want to be sure that you don't accidentally seal any moisture in, but the envelopes will then have to be protected from humidity. You might want to try saving each seed type in paper and then sealing the whole collection in an airtight container like a mason jar or a plastic tub. You can save seeds in the refrigerator or the freezer if you need extremely long-term storage, but Proper storage at room temperature will keep seeds viable for years. Um, just about every seed will grow well after at least two to three years of storage, and some can last 10 years or more. Seed companies only sell seeds from the current year because quality does gradually go down over time, but you can easily save multiple years worth of seeds and then not have to save them again for a while. And be sure to label all of your seeds with the date variety name, and any details that would be helpful, especially if you're doing a multi-year project. I recommend that you do a viability test for all saved seeds um, just to make sure that they will actually sprout. Um, there could have been an issue with pollination or harvest or storage, and if you find out well in advance of planting, um, either pretty soon after you harvest or when you're getting ready to plant, especially after long-term storage, you will have the chance to either save the seeds again or buy more seeds if it's necessary. To test your seeds, um, you just place a number of seeds, at least 10, uh, 20 is better if you can, inside of a folded up moist paper towel inside of a plastic bag. You just leave that on the counter for a few days to a week and then open it up and count how many have sprouted. The percentage of sprouted seeds compared to the total number of seeds gives you the germination rate. Most commercial seed packets will be around 90 to 98% in their first year of storage. But that is under ideal conditions, and remember that the garden is almost never ideal conditions when you're planting. So when you put it in the ground, you probably won't get 90 to 98% germination. So if you do the test and you find you only have 50% germination, um, you may think that you need to double the amount in order to get enough, but you'll want to actually plant even more than that. You'll probably end up with more seeds than you need, and this is a great opportunity to share with other gardeners. There are occasional seed swaps locally um, in normal years uh, where you can trade your extra seeds for um, new crops that you want to try. Just be very careful about pests and disease when trading seeds. Be very sure that you only share clean seeds, and when accepting seeds saved by other gardeners, ask them about their precautions um, so that you don't bring anything into your garden that you don't want. So uh, get creative, do some experimenting, and get into the world of seed saving. Um, sometimes it will go better than other times, so I recommend planting out any experimental seeds along with a tried and true variety, but you may end up with really fabulous results and be able to tailor your garden to be exactly how you want it. All right, time to switch gears to season extension. So I hope by now you have a general understanding of what the summer crops are versus the spring and fall crops, like your classic summertime crops, things like tomatoes, peppers, cucumber squash, all the crops that really thrive in warm weather. 
These crops are called the tender crops because even the lightest frost or freeze can injure or kill them. You will not be able to extend the season of these crops for too long without a heat source. Then you have all your cool weather crops, the ones that do best in spring and fall, like kale, cabbage, lettuce, spinach. Um, most of these crops are hardy, which means that they can survive a frost, and some can even survive a hard freeze with no protection at all. So um, these hardy crops are your best candidates for keeping in your garden during the winter. Um, there are several different ways to keep your crops a bit warmer when the temperatures are low and you can use these methods to be able to plant your tender crops a little earlier in the spring and keep them a few weeks later into the fall, um, making their growing season quite a bit longer um, as well as to protect your hardy crops all winter long. Um, so with your winter crops you can harvest them of course. You can go get fresh carrots and fresh collards in the middle of January which is pretty cool. Um, you can also overwinter them, keep them alive all winter, and then be able to start harvesting the crops um, in the spring around the same time that you would be starting planting, um, which gives you a pretty major head start. You can also uh, use these techniques to protect crops like perennial herbs or biennial crops that you want to save seeds from next year. There are a few different terms that I'll be using, and I want to make sure that they're clear. A freeze is any time the temperature drops below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This will kill all tender vegetables. A hard freeze is when the temperature drops below 28 degrees. A hard freeze can potentially damage or kill semi-hardy crops, which are the more delicate spring and fall crops. There's also a severe freeze, which is lower than 24 degrees, and that can do more damage, but at a certain point it doesn't make too much of a difference. A frost is specifically talking about that visible frost on the plants. This doesn't always happen. You can have temperatures well below freezing without frost. It only happens when the humidity and the wind are at the right levels. But you can see frost all the way up to 36 degrees. And that ice will damage tender crops even if it's above freezing. So it's important to take note of the forecast anytime it's in the 30s, not just 32 or below and your garden's exact temperature may also be different from the nearest weather station and you may have noticed in the past that some parts of your yard get frosted earlier than others um, because there are always temperature fluctuations in low spots, sunnier spots, sheltered spots, and so on. So it really helps to know your exact location well for what to expect. Um, you might also want to use a high-low thermometer if you know that the forecast isn't too accurate to your exact location and you want to get better at uh, predicting those types of frosts. So like I mentioned, there is a range of cold tolerance within the winter crops. Fully hardy crops can survive hard freezes and this is most brassicas, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, kale, rutabaga, and turnips. Um, as well as the alliums, garlic, onions, and leeks, and spinach. So these don't need as much protection. Semi-hardy crops do fine with light freezes, but below 28 degrees they will need heavier protection. So cauliflower, lettuce, and other greens, beets, carrots, potatoes, chard, peas, and parsnips. Um, root crops and chard will lose their leaves from a hard freeze, but the roots themselves should be fine with a thick layer of mulch on top. You need to plan ahead for a winter garden and do all of your planting in the fall. Um, very roughly speaking, you plant in July and August for fall harvests, August and September for winter harvests, and September or October for early spring harvests, but this will vary by crop. This is because not much will actually grow during the winter. The growth of many crops is controlled by day length, even more than temperature. Um, so from around mid-November to mid-January, uh, the day length is under 10 hours, which is basically the minimum for plant growth. So during that time, don't expect to see much of any change and don't expect fast growth until around March. Your goal should be for your crops to be most of the way grown by Thanksgiving and plan to have enough that you can harvest all you want without needing much regrowth. So if you want eight kale leaves per week in the winter, um, that would take a lot more plants than it would in the summer because what you already have is pretty much what you will have. Um, you can almost think of your winter garden as an outdoor fridge during that really cold, dark period. 
Your winter harvest crops should be just about mature and your crops that you are saving for early spring harvest should be around 75% mature. Um, if you plant too late in the fall for winter harvest, um, you'll still probably be able to do an early spring harvest instead. Um, and then in the spring, you can start planting again in March, especially if you do no-till gardening where you're able to work the soil uh, sooner. Hardy crops uh, can be planted in early March and tender crops can be planted a couple weeks before the last frost date in April, as long as the forecast is looking good and you're prepared to cover them just in case. So there are a few main ways that a home gardener can cover up their crops for the winter. Um, let's start with good old mulch. Uh, remember, you should be mulching your entire garden for winter anyway, whether you're growing anything or not, to protect your soil from compaction and erosion. But a layer around all of your winter crops will also help keep the roots warm and encourage a little bit more growth in colder weather. So I strongly, strongly recommend that you use mulch along with the rest of these methods. You may also have some crops that you want to overwinter, but that don't need above ground protection. If you've got carrots or beets in the ground, perennial herbs, a biennial you want to save for seed. In that case, a thick layer of maybe six inches of mulch should help uh, to keep those roots protected. And then you can also add more methods on top, uh, like a cloche or cold frame for those roots. But if it's only underground, a thick layer of mulch will probably be enough. So a cloche is just a cover for an individual plant. A really easy version of this, if you have a very small plant, is just like a milk carton with the bottom cut out. Um, this will only give you a couple of degrees of protection, but sometimes that can make all the difference. For taller plants, uh, you could use stakes or tomato cages as a structure and wrap material around that. Um, there are also pre-made uh, glass and plastic different versions of cloches. One version has brand names like Wall of Water or Cozy Coat. Um, it's a plastic cylinder with cells that you fill with water as insulation. It's open on top and um, it's relatively common to use these for starting early tomatoes in the spring. They can get kind of expensive, but some people really swear by them. So cloches are the perfect option if you just have a couple of plants that need protection. Maybe you have a few plants that aren't close to your other winter crops. Then there is the cold frame, which is kind of like a mini greenhouse. You build walls around the crops you want to protect um, out of plastic or wood, concrete blocks, straw bales, um, whatever you have. And then you put a roof on top. Uh, lots of people use old windows for the roof, but um, corrugated plastic also works well, or if you have soft plastic built into some kind of frame to hold it. Um, it's the best if you can angle the roof towards the south for the most heat and keep any water or snow um, running off of it. Depending on your materials, a cold frame can give you pretty significant protection and act pretty much like a solar greenhouse. It works the best for a blocky shaped area, like if you have a patch of beets or lettuce, and you can build it onto a bed that's already planted, or you can plant um, the crops directly into the cold frame if you plan ahead. However, cold frames can overheat, so you will probably need to check them on sunny days and vent them open, but um, they really do a great job of keeping your crops warm. Then if you have a larger area, like if you want to cover a whole row, you can use a low tunnel. This is the row cover fabric that I talked about in the troubleshooting video for pest control. So the mo most common method for this is to just put um, semicircle hoops over the bed, usually plastic pipes or wire, and then cover this frame with a lightweight fabric. The fabric needs to be a few feet wider than the bed to account for it going up and over, plus extra so that it can be weighed down on the sides and the ends. To weigh down the fabric, you can use pipes, boards, bricks, landscapes, staples, anything that will keep the wind from catching it and keep the cold from creeping in. You can also bury it in the soil, but this is less ideal um, during the winter <laughs> in case the soil freezes. Um, the best thing to use is a row cover fabric that is made specifically for gardening. In a pinch, you could use old bed sheets or some other kind of fabric if you have it. 
um, but I definitely recommend gardening fabric if you plan to keep them on um, for a significant portion of the winter, more than just a couple of days. Two common brands of row cover fabric are Rime and Agrabon, and each piece should last you multiple seasons if you take good care of it. So row cover fabric is made to let water and light through in the appropriate amounts, and it comes in different thicknesses for summer and winter use. So the heaviest winter fabrics can give 10 degrees of protection, um, while more medium weights give just a couple degrees. The trade-off is that the more cold protection it gives, the less light is able to come through. So for example, Agrabon's lightest weight winter row cover gives protection down to 28 degrees and allows 85% of light to pass through. Their heaviest weight protects down below 24 degrees, but only allows 30% of light through. So if your goal is just to keep your plants alive, overwinter them through to the spring, the heavier weight is definitely your best bet because they don't really need the light. But if your focus is on maybe harvesting greens during the winter and getting that early spring planting going, you may wanna go with a lighter weight if your crops can handle it. And you can double up two layers of fabric if needed, um, and in an extreme cold spell, you could also throw a layer of uh, clear plastic on top. So a word on materials for covering your plants. Um, your two main options are fabric and plastic, and both have their pros and cons. Um, plastic can give quite a bit more protection than fabric. Uh, it's a full wind barrier and it gives better insulation. Um, it's also a bit sturdier, it may last you longer. However, it can get extremely hot under plastic on sunny days. Your plants can cook to death when it's 30 degrees outside. I'm very serious about this. Um, if you plan to use plastic, you need to open up the covers every time it's sunny and try to time it so that there's not much temperature change um, because hot and cold swings can be very hard on your crops. You will also need to ventilate plastic periodically just to make sure that there isn't too much moisture inside or whether it's too dry and it needs water. So in general for this climate and basic winter gardening, um, my recommendation is fabric, especially if you don't want to fuss with your garden all the time during the winter. Then other methods include high tunnels, which are like low tunnels but covered in plastic and tall enough to walk inside. Um, these work best for very large-scale gardens, but it is something to keep in mind if you ever plan to expand. Um, we have two high tunnels out at the community garden and they work really well. Then, of course, uh, other methods include greenhouses, which are heated and would allow you to even grow tomatoes year-round if you wanted to. Uh, however, they can be extremely expensive uh, depending on what materials you use. A much simpler version is just to move any plants that you really want to keep into pots and bring them into the house. Um, you could also do a countertop garden in the winter. You could sow seeds for small herbs and greens to grow um, during the winter and that will give you a nice harvest as well. If you need an emergency cover, like if there's one cold night coming up but it's not really time to set up a full system yet, um, you can use just about anything for short-term protection a ceramic pot, a cardboard box, an old blanket, a tarp, um, just about anything that'll keep cold air off of your plants, especially if you've got just a frost. Um, so if you're able to protect your tender crops for the first one or two light frosts and freezes, um, you may be able to get multiple weeks more production out of them uh, if the weather warms back up again. Um, just be sure to take um, whatever you use off again in the morning so the plants can breathe and get light and all of that. The gamble though um, with short-term covers like this is that it could be colder than expected and the plant could end up dying anyway. So you'll need to use your judgment and decide whether you're going to harvest all of your green tomatoes before the freeze or leave them on in case the plant is able to keep producing for a few more weeks. I usually end up doing a little bit of both, um, harvesting the ones that I really don't want to lose, but leaving a few in case the plant survives. Um, sometimes you can still do your final harvest after a light frost, but the texture will pretty much be lost and for something like winter squash, they won't store well. So um, as best you can try and figure out when, when you want to harvest based on the forecast. Okay. 
So you have all of those covers, cloches, cold frames, tunnels, and all of them add not only warmth, but also protection from the elements. So even if you're growing something like collards that could survive outside on its own, you may want to put a cover over it anyway to protect it from heavy wind and snow and hail. I generally recommend that anything in your winter garden that has leaves that can be damaged uh, should be under some type of cover if possible. Row cover fabric gives the smallest amount of protection in general, so that's best suited for the brassicas and the alliums, which don't need much help and more tender, semi-hardy plants like lettuce and peas will do better in a cold frame that gives more insulation. So you've got your winter garden set up, now what do you need to do? Um, for the most part, the winter garden is very hands-off. Um, if you're using plastic covers or cold frames, of course you will need to go out and ventilate them, but other than that, the pace of the garden moves much slower than in summer, as you can imagine. Um, you will have some weeds growing under your covers, um, but chances are that it'll just be something like chickweed that you may be able to just sort of ignore. It is also possible to still have insect damage, like from aphids and caterpillars, particularly in the early spring as it starts to warm back up, so you'll need to look out for that. You probably won't need to water during the winter, especially if you use fabric covers instead of plastic. You will need to keep a closer eye on your plants if you use plastic because it keeps rain out but it also traps moisture inside and you could end up with fungal growth. Um, you shouldn't need to apply fertilizer during the winter. Things will grow very slowly but that's just due to that short day length so don't worry about that. Um, nitrogen can actually cause the plants to become less cold resistant so it's best to hold off until early spring and then um, maybe give a foliar spray of compost tea if it looks like your crops need it. For harvesting winter crops, most of them can freeze solid and be fine, um, but wait for them to thaw back out um, before harvesting uh, to preserve their texture and avoid damaging the plant. And make sure that you don't over harvest because remember leaves will not grow back nearly as fast in the winter as they do the rest of the year. So uh, winter is a great time to try new crops because you'll have plenty of space available. Um, winter vegetables tend to be much sweeter than in the summer. Um, carrots, spinach, collards, um, and many more all have a much higher sugar content to keep themselves warm, which results in a much better flavor. So even if they're not usually your favorites, you might want to give them a try. And you're not stuck with just uh, lettuce and spinach for salads. There's all kinds of other greens that you could try if you're feeling adventurous. Um, arugula, corn salad, claytonia, tot soy, all kinds of things. Um, make sure that you choose cold tolerant varieties if you have the option. Lettuce, for example, can be found in both heat tolerant and cold tolerant varieties. So obviously they should be planted at different times and that can help lengthen both growing seasons. So winter can be a great slow paced time for gardening. It's a perfect time to experiment and make the most of that time between the main gardening seasons. Um, it's pretty exciting to be able to eat homegrown food all year round, even if uh, it's just a few radishes or greens. Um, a lot of crops can stand up to more than you'd think, so you should definitely give it a try. Okay, that's it. Um, thanks, of course, to Homegrown's funder, Americans Helping Americans. Um, please let me know um, what you would like help with for any seed saving or winter gardening that you want to do this year. Um, of course, you can always ask questions. I can provide you with materials, whatever you need. Next month, um, I will just be covering some different bits and pieces that I may not have covered yet and um, giving you some tips for gardening on your own next year and beyond. So um, please let me know if you have any topics that you would like to be covered in that final video. All right, thanks for watching.